Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today as we explore the C in our Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada. We're exploring the whole health and housing continuum today, caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. And I'm thrilled that you have an opportunity to join us. We are coming to you live from Facebook and YouTube Live. We are also on our webinar today, and you may be even watching it asynchronously afterwards. Welcome to all of you today. Just a special little moment where I thank our sponsors. It's, it's so important that wherever possible for CanAge that we make our resources as free or low cost as possible. We're delighted to offer this free conference series. And our sponsors, HelpAge Canada, Canadian Frailty Network, AgeWell, IROC, and United Way, particularly their Helping Aging program, have made this session happen. Thank you also to our co-hosts. And you'll see that it takes a village to make change in this area. And we're so grateful that our co-hosts, other organizations who are working to advance the rights and well-being to make sure that Canada is more age inclusive are partners for us today. A couple of housekeeping things at the very beginning. So as an attendee, your microphone and video are going to be turned off during the webinar. So never fear if your dog comes across your screen or your kid pops in, we won't be able to see that. But we are asking you to actively participate. You will see in the chat box that you have an opportunity to engage with the panelists and with each other. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in just a second. You may need to finagle with your screen a little bit. If you're trying to adjust the video size of your speakers, you can drag the line between the video frame and the slides to the left, and you may want to adjust that at some point. Reminder, we are recording and we are broadcasting right now. So how can you be active and engaged during this dynamic session? Please, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is join us via chat and we'll have our expert panelists engage in the chat. We'll all be on there as well. There'll be great opportunity to say hello, where you're from, what organization, if you have one that you're representing, and you feel free to share resources or make comments throughout the session. If you've got questions, please open up the Q&A box. You'll see on your toolbar, a little double bubble panel with the word Q&A underneath it. Just click on that and you can submit questions to us at any point throughout the session today. And we're gonna be drawing upon that Q&A uh, throughout our moderated panel. So quick note about the chat. If you open up your chat box, you may see that it drops down with a little arrow. It may default to all panelists. You might want to share as Kathleen has done. Hi, Kathleen. You might want to share to all panelists and attendees. So just drop to the arrow and choose the second one. And I'm going to put a little note. Hi, everyone, uh, right here from me. So again, in order to not just have it go to the panelists, but to have everyone be able to see what you're sharing and where you're from, make sure that you do a little drop down and then share to all panelists and attendees. Tell us who you are, where you're from, an organization. Feel free, any right resources. Is a super quick evaluation at the end, just a few seconds to do so. And we're going to ask you to just have a couple of answers so that we can continuously engage in providing positive feedback for you. You know, so much that we are doing involves social media. And so some of the issues that we're looking at can be trended on our social media, and we're suggesting that you use some of these hashtags. We'll put them into the chat as well. Can Age Seniors and Can Age Voices, Age Inclusive Canada, Caregiving and Long-Term Care. Again, we'll copy those into our chat. So here's the run of what we're gonna to do today. I'm gonna to start off with a little bit more of that housekeeping and then I'm gonna be able to turn it over and talk a little bit more about our major publication called Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada. I'm going to spend a few minutes introducing our panelists today. Like all of our expert panels, each one of them is a keynote speaker in their own right. And we're so delighted that we have them today. We've got people from coast to coast to coast, and we're delighted to hear a wide diversity of their views. So we're going to ask them in turn for about five minutes each, as if we were on a stage having a fireside chat. From their perspective, what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive? thinking about the C in voices, caregiving, 
long-term care, home care, and housing. At that point, we're gonna have our dynamic Q&A. Do feel free to engage with other participants uh, on the chat, but if you wanna ask our panel something, click the Q&A and put your questions in there. We've got a good chunk of time to have an active and engaged moderated session, and I'm gonna be looking to have your questions answered by our expert panel. We've got a few extra resources at the end and some ways to have uh, further connection as well. And great to see everybody rolling in. Please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. We're excited to have you on this live session today. And for those of you who are coming to us via YouTube and Facebook Live, welcome, especially to you. Do feel free, our social media there, our comments are being monitored. So if you'd like to ask questions, put it into your chat, the YouTube section or in the comments on our Facebook Live. And we'll make sure that we get your questions that way as well. Now, Canada was somewhat unique in the OECD countries by not actually having a proper plan for how to address our aging population. And there have been other attempts, but no real one place that roadmaps out what we need to do to make Canada ready, able, and well prepared for the challenges that we are having before of us today in terms of our aging population. This is especially true given the context of COVID-19. The roadmap you can download at canage.ca slash voices. And again, that will be in our chat with the link. So canage.ca slash voices. You can download it as a PDF. But if you'd like to have it on a more active basis on that website, you can click down and open up in like an accordion dynamic set of links. Our roadmap is made up of six compass points, 40 issues, and 135 recommendations. You see our compass points that we're exploring over the course of each of the conference. So today at this session, we're talking about caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. So what does that mean? The issues that we identified, and again, if you were online, you could click on any one of those and you would open up and see a key, a key set of recommendations. We're looking at these particular set of issues that we've identified as part of our roadmap. Supporting family caregivers, what do they need to do? We're so pleased to have the CEO of the Canada Care, the Ontario Caregiving Organization here to talk about a little bit more about that today. But there's lots of different kinds of caregivers. We need to make sure that they all get the support. We heard from the throne speech about long-term care national quality standards. And we also have, we're very blessed to have a Rachel Blaney from the federal NDP, the, the WIP, who was the former seniors critic. And I know that the NDP have been thinking about national quality standards and we heard something announced about them in the throne speech. So maybe we'll dig in a little bit more. Staffing is a key issue, and I know that everyone shares the questions about how to make staffing, particularly long-term care, sustainable and prepared for the future, as well as making sure people are safe and well-paid. We know the infrastructure investments and upgrades are a key point. We've heard some commitments about that, depending on which province you're in, and, and some notion of it from a federal level. But what do we need to do from a structural point of view? to make sure that particularly long-term care is supported, but maybe also what kind of buildings will be created. We know that we're trying to change the model of care and uh, we've talked a lot about the different ways or modalities in which long-term care is delivered. And so we are making recommendations for transformative or emotion-focused care. We'll hear more about how the models of care make a big difference to the types of care a little bit later. You know, home care has been one of those issues that we've been finding as well is really overlooked time after time again. And we know that many people wish to stay at home, but we haven't given the supports in order to allow people to functionally do that. Home can be expensive. Housing affordability is a real thing, depending on where you live, more or less of the case, but largely in urban centers or where housing is scarce, affordability is a real issue. And we all not just talk about affordability, but how do we support people staying and aging in place? What do we need to do to be able to prepare aging in place? And what does that look like across the health and housing continuum? I'm Laura Tamplin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. I've been working in the field for a few decades now, and my background 
comes from law and policy and advocacy. And I'm you know, very committed to making sure that as Canadians, we have the voice of older people represented always at this table and that where research is engaged, seniors are not just being studied, but they're helping to inform and direct the research. That where policy making is happening, that older people aren't just given a bit of a pat on the head, but are integral in the creation of policy which affects their lives. That's what I am trying to do. So delighted to introduce to you Rachel Blaney, our Member of Parliament for uh, you know, Vancouver Island and the North Island, Powell River in British Columbia. Um, and, and Rachel has been absolutely vital in this particular area. I know that she's personally passionate about it and she has been very strongly advocating in her past roles as seniors critic. She's the NDP whip and critic for Veterans Affairs. She has been out on the edge of social justice for years and we're so delighted to have her today. We're also introducing Amy Kupel, who's the CEO of the Ontario Caregiver Organization. She's also a CanAge Fellow. We're thrilled that Amy is the inaugural leader and CEO of this organization, which is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health to support Ontario's 3.3 million caregivers. You know, Amy is looking at the entire spectrum of caregiving across the life course, and she's been passionately working to support older people, particularly in this time of crisis of COVID-19. Amy, we're glad to have you. Another good friend, Donna Duncan. She's the CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. And I know that Donna hasn't slept, I think, in a very long time because she's been at the front lines for making sure that long-term care is able to meet the needs, particularly during COVID-19, but also in a transforming time. She's CEO of this organization, which is the largest organization. She represents long-term care home providers in Canada. Important to know that you know, the Ontario Long-Term Care Association is a wide association representing for-profit, not-for-profit, and other types of homes too across the health and housing continuum. She has a deep understanding about community health, acute health, chronic health, and long-term care. We've been so pleased to have her at the front lines and grateful for the work that she's been doing. Dee Lender, another wonderful friend, is the Executive Director of the Ontario Associations of Residence Councils. And Dee has dedicated her life to bringing voice, resident voice, out. Not just during this time of COVID-19, but, you know, on an ongoing basis. Now, it, those voices can be quite muted, particularly when older people were locked up and in many cases deprived of their rights to go outside or see people that are close to them. She's been dedicated to her work in gerontology and has always at the core, you know, kept that voice of older people and now in particular, older residents of long-term care to the fore. So wonderful to have Jennifer Wadagajic up. And, and Jennifer's worn many, many hats. She's been involved in the North in a number of different ways. She's a lecturer at the Clinical Sciences Division of Northern Ontario School of Medicine. She's also a consultant at Unity Perspective and Innovation Consulting. Jennifer has been actively engaged in Nunavut and the territories and Nunavik. And she's going to be speaking and bringing the perspective of Northern, rural, remote, fly-in, and also some of the different cultural aspects about Indigenous communities, and how when we're talking about the health and housing continuum, we don't always think about what the needs are across this country. You know, we, it's easy to think about what's happening in the South and even to complain about these issues of accessibility. It must be hard to hear that when we're talking about complaining in Toronto, Vancouver and Halifax, when in rural and remote communities and fly in communities, services may be thousands of kilometers away functionally unable for many to access them. I'm asking the question, how can we make Canada more age inclusive? And after this session, we're gonna to go to a Q&A. Again, don't forget to make sure that you put your questions as they come in the floor.
So right now is my delight to introduce to you a true leader in the field, someone who works tirelessly for constituents and for all Canadians. Rachel, you have been involved in community social justice throughout your career. Seniors have been a passionate issue for you, community seniors, seniors in long-term care and across. Now you have that position of authority representing not just your constituents, but really the voice of so many older Canadians. So I get to ask you first, how do we need what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive in our health and housing continuum? Over to you, Rachel. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm really appreciative that today is happening. I think this issue continues to be such a priority. And if nothing else, sadly, COVID has really brought awareness to so many people who may not have understood the discrepancies across this country. Um, so I first of all just want to say uh, that this is a personal issue for me as well. My mother is in a long-term care facility. Uh, it was very hard during COVID to uh, hear her calling me crying because she was lonely because some of the basic things that she needed to help with uh, were not there for her and you know we worked really hard to try to find those ways. But when it comes to answering your question, I think the reality is exactly what you said earlier. We do not have a national strategy in this country. We We've known for quite a while that we would have a growing aging population, the needs of this community would grow and change uh, very rapidly and we needed a, a response. The NDP has been pushing for a long term time to have a national senior strategy and I think this is very important. The reason uh, that I think is, you know, one of the key challenges is there's always this jurisdiction war uh, and seniors get left out in those jurisdiction wars. So whose problem is it anyways? Is it the federal government? Is it the provincial government? You know, we we all watched uh, during the beginning of COVID there, and it continues to be a concern for me as we get into the second wave, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces going into some of our seniors' homes across Canada and supporting people during this very stressful time. So, you know, this shows that there is a total lack of planning. So we continue to fight for that so that there is sort of those opportunities uh, for provincial and federal governments to come together to work with stakeholders in the communities. And as a, a member of Parliament who represents a more rural and remote community, uh, I think it's really important that we understand the regional response to addressing seniors' concerns uh, has to be done locally because we know the problems in our area. Um, and the other thing that I've always felt passionate about with the National Senior Strategy is, is an opportunity for experts across Canada to come together and share what's working well and where challenges are so that we can sort of have that collaborative approach and we just don't have it right now. You know, I, I think about um, this interesting trend that I'm seeing in my writing and I've heard from other folks uh, that they're seeing the same thing, which is some of our rural and remote communities are seeing the elderly in their community sort of pushed out lack of resources. And so they're being moved into bigger communities where they don't have that social infrastructure becoming extremely isolated and their needs are not being met. And then at the same time, we see these younger seniors in our communities being pushed out of the more urban areas into the rural communities communities because that's where uh, they can afford to live. And so we have this switch of seniors moving around and it's not being tracked in a meaningful way. So when we look at housing, when we look at long-term care, uh, these things become more and more important. And of course, as a caregiver, my brother and I share the duty of, of caring for our mother and doing what we can while she's at this point in her life. You know, we're, and then all the workers, that there isn't really that assessment point. We know, and we saw this again, um, and you know, it's sad to say, but COVID really did, I think, show so many Canadians the realities of what's happening. But a lot of people who are working in these fields are working two or three different jobs uh, because they aren't getting paid enough they're not getting that full-time work and then of course COVID showed uh, that they got isolated because they couldn't move from organization to organization and and of course long-term care and and I think I'll wrap it up on this point but one of the things that we know is that there are so many horrific situations that are often hidden and I've talked with caregivers as well who talk about the challenge that they have both as you know children or loved ones caring for seniors and then the actual people working in the industry where the people working in the industry want to fight for more uh, but they have a hard time getting people who were the caregivers of loved ones to come out and speak because it was such a 
painful time in their life and they feel bad for their lack of ability to support them in the way that they wanted to. Um, and so we don't see that cohesiveness. And I think, again, that's why a national senior strategy is so important. And it's time to put those areas of care nationally so that we can actually track it and hold them to account. We saw that across Canada, it happens every day, but that difference in care uh, and what it looks like. And if there is no national standards, how do we take that next step so that we can support the people who are caring for seniors on all levels and make sure that those standards are high enough that we don't ever have to see something like this happen again. It's shameful in our country that the people who built this country that we are so blessed to live in are being left behind again and again. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you again. I really appreciated the information in the roadmap. And of course, I can only stay till about quarter to two. Uh, but I'm so grateful for all the work all of you do every day to make such a difference for seniors in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate all the work that you've been doing. I just say, I know it's a passionately important issue for you that you've done both personally with that heart on you, but also with that leadership. Thanks very much. We'll let you mute your video and we're gonna welcome back to the stage, a dear friend of mine, Dee Lender. Uh, Dee is the Executive Director of the Ontario Association of Residence Councils. And you know, Dee, I know that you've been working day in and day out to bring the voice of residents forward. And sir, we saw that for folks here who are joining from other jurisdictions the, beyond Ontario, you may have seen on National Seniors Day, October 1st, that the Commission of the Long-Term Care um, Review released some of the comments of people that your organization represents. It was very powerful to hear their voices about what it was like for them to live during COVID-19. But let's take a step back at a high level. What do we need to do to make caregiving, long-term care, home care and housing more inclusive? I know your focus is on long-term care. Over to you. Thank you very much. So how do we create age inclusivity? Um, this is a, an issue of social change, one that involves challenging our ageist views, some that are overtly incorrect and painful and some that are disguised sometimes as cute or funny or comedic. The, the views that as we age, we lose purpose, we lose drive, function and value in society. I am the executive director of the Ontario Association of Residence Councils. Our mandate brings us front and center into the long-term care sector where ageism can flourish if not intentionally thwarted. We are part of a larger social change or culture change movement that insists that we reframe our views towards long-term care living and working. So when someone moves into a long-term care home, traditionally it was viewed that they were for all intents and purposes plucked out of community, out of their own usefulness and put into an institution, a place where no one wants to be, where they become passive recipients of care that is expertly designed for them by well-meaning health professionals. Care is done to them, not with them. So we've worked hard at moving that needle from viewing long-term care as institutional living to a more social model of living and working. While focus is certainly on the provision of excellent medical attention, the whole person, all aspects of personhood are now seen as important to nourish. So our, our legislation is written in person-centered language and over the years, there has been a growing acceptance that long-term care is not a place to go to die, but a place to go to live the best possible life you just need some extra help, but life goes on and needs to go on with purpose, um, self-determination, choice, dignity, respect. Language is so important. And we see this and, and we advocate for this all the time in OARC. People are not their diagnoses. Um, it's not Mrs. Smith, or sorry, it is Mrs. Smith. It's not the diabetic in room 101 or the Alzheimer's case. During meal times, you don't feed someone, you assist with their lunch. You assist with their breakfast. P 
people don't wear bibs. They wear clothing protectors and on and on. So as, as simple as the language we use in our society conveys ageism or counter ageism. Long-term care homes are places, at least in Ontario, where residence councils are mandatory. So the law in Ontario stipulates that every long-term care home must have a residence council, that the home needs to support that function as well. So this is directly to combat ageism in two very intentional ways. The first is to provide a forum for residents to voice challenges, concerns, celebrations, et cetera, anything uh, to come to consensus decisions as a group and it views to advise the management of their home to evoke real change, not just lip service, but to evoke real change, to voice what residents want to see changed to better their quality of living. The second aspect of a residence council in terms of combating ageism has to do with providing peer-to-peer -peer support and to um, maintain the connection with community. So people, people need to be needed, need to have a purpose, need to have an opportunity to build relationships and look out for one another. They need to be part of the solution and part of building community with their peers. Residence Council is that as well. OARC looks at ageism in the face challenges status quo and encourages communities and team members and society as a whole to view residents as whole human beings. A vast majority of people living in long-term care homes have dementia. In the general mainstream societal view, that's seen as sad, um, tragic, hopeless, but we believe that even in the throes of dementia, people have purpose and need to be supported to find their purpose. A key aspect of, of um, upholding dignity and respect for seniors and, and all residents in long-term care revolves around the resident's bill of rights. It speaks to the core values that need to be front and center in the lived experience of every person who calls long-term care home, home. I wanted to highlight a resource that is available on our website at OARC, and it's this one here. It's called Through Our Eyes, Bringing the Residents' Bill of Rights Alive. It's a program that guides long-term care home team members or staff and residents to co-develop and co-facilitate education sessions about the Residents' Bill of Rights. The program provides educators with a step-by-step -step guide, videos, exercises, etc., to develop the education directly with a resident, even residents who are caught in the throes of, of profound cognitive change. This resource is available. It resides in every long-term care home in Ontario. Um, Circling back to the notion of passivity, how residents can be seen as passive recipients of care, it's always very, very important, particularly in the context of COVID-19, to remember that residents need to be kept well informed of what's happening in their home. They need to understand, they need to have the communication uh, between management and them so that the ambiguity of, of what might be going on is put to rest. Another resource that I wanted to highlight for you, and again, it's available on our website, looks like this if you download it or print it off. It's a communication tool um, that OARC created. We surveyed residents and we asked them, what do you want to know from your home, particularly in the, the circumstance of COVID-19, but generally as well, when communication, when residence councils are, um, are not able to meet as they typically would, small group sessions are, are very difficult during outbreak and, and COVID, we asked residents, what do you want to know? And it boiled down to four main areas. They want to know what the commitment is of the management of the home to their resident, to their well-being, 
and ongoing communication. They want to know what is the current status of COVID-19 in their home. They want to know how the home is keeping residents safe, any aspect to do with that. And they also wanted to know what the home has in place to keep residents connected with the people that they love. Homes have had terrific success in keeping residents well informed using this tool. And again, it is available on the OERC website. The last concept that I'd like to mention um, is it centers around the saying, a nation's greatness is measured by how it treats its most vulnerable and elders. This, this concept gives me great reason to pause, um, to look at how we, our society, our nation, how have we prepared the healthcare system to receive and to support the best quality of life for our elders, our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, all, all of, all of our, our loved ones who laid the foundation for our society, for all that we enjoy today. Our long-term care homes across the country need serious attention. They must be built and staffed and resourced and available to support the needs of our seniors, providing the best of what we as a society can offer. We have to do better. We've not, gone, we've, we've not done good enough, not by a long shot. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I certainly look forward to your, your questions and our conversation in a little while. Thanks very much, Dee. Really appreciate all of the work that you do. I'll let you mute your video as I transition. I just want to share with you that many people were excited to know where some of those resources are. And I do want you to know that they have been put in the chat. So for folks who are looking for those resources, we encourage you have a look at the chat. You'll see that they all those links and so on have been posted there. So through our eyes, bringing the residents Bill of Rights Alive, an educational program that incorporates residents as teachers. You will see there, Christiane posted it right there up in the chat with some other great resources. Do feel free to share your own resources as well and also to join our Q&A. It's a great pleasure to introduce another dear friend of mine, Donna Duncan. Donna, please feel free to uh, come to the stage. You have been at the forefront as so many of our colleagues like, uh, like Dee and Rachel have as well. We know that you know, you've been working tirelessly before that to raise the issues. And people always are asking us, I don't know how many times you and I have been on panels where they say, are you surprised by what's happening in COVID-19? And I always say, not really. I'm you know, horrified, but not surprised. You know, Dee, my big open question to you, what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive on the issues that we share together? Over to you. Oh, great. Thanks, Laura. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's a real privilege to uh, share the stage with uh, all of these wonderful partners. Uh, and I would say that uh, if there's been a great thing that, that has come out of this, this tragic crisis uh, is that we're all working together. And uh, that's the thing that gives me hope. And certainly, as uh, MPP uh, Blaney co commented, this really shone a light on on the fact that no one really had an appreciation for what long-term care was in Canada, um, but quite, and, and who's in long-term care. And quite honestly, it's not unique to Canada. Uh, you know, I know that through this, I've been um, meeting regularly with my global partners. Uh, ageism uh, is endemic in, uh, around the world. And, you know, it's tragic that it's taken COVID-19 in a global pandemic to, shine a light on this, open our eyes, uh, and help us realize, uh, to Dee's po point, we have to do better. Uh, and certainly as we look at the future of long-term care, we have to have an adult discussion uh, about how are we gonna better support these individuals who, who built their families and built their communities. Uh, you know, we, we invest in what we value, uh, and clearly, uh, we need to demonstrate that we value our seniors and our residents. Uh, we need to demonstrate that they are collective and shared responsibility. It's not about one level of government over another or one part of the system over another. Uh, it really has to be about coming together. This is our moment. Uh, and if we really are going to have impact, it must be collective impact. Uh, and we need to hold our elected officials, but accountable for, for helping 
to make sure that we've got the building blocks, the policy levers, the funding levers uh, to help us build out a new workforce. Uh, HR certainly is our number one issue in long-term care, not just in Canada, not just in Ontario, not just in Canada. It is a global issue. Uh, and so how do we build it? How do we build an, a, an army? How do we make people excited who want to come in to care for our seniors and support them and, and validate them? This is our challenge. But, but this is the moment to rise to that challenge. We are uh, really quite excited about the opportunity to reframe uh, long term care in this context, you know, certainly and, and quite unfortunately, I, I believe uh, we got caught up in numbers. So we in long term care, we talk about beds, we talk about owners, we talk about operators and certainly uh, in this COVID environment, we talked about the numbers of deaths. We've lost sight of the fact that this is actually at its at, at its heart about people. It's about the people who are in long-term care beds. It's about people who are sitting beside those beds. It's about the people who are caring for those people in the beds and supporting those people who are working in our long-term care homes. Uh, these homes are, are part of our communities. Uh, and certainly we saw a stark difference in how communities rallied around homes in smaller communities, but in those urban centers, they became more anonymous. Uh, and we, we've got to correct that. We, we have to find a way to come together to champion uh, the people who are, are working in uh, and living in long-term care. This can't be about pointing fingers. Uh, this is, we have one real enemy in this, it's COVID-19. I, I do believe that, you know, if we can, certainly in Ontario, we're aggressively advocating for new infrastructure, for infrastructure upgrades. Certainly, we know that if we're going to have new employees, we have to keep them safe. We have to keep our residents safe. So giving us the right tools, especially in a pandemic around personal protective equipment and certainly uh, uh, tests, uh, prioritizing our seniors for less invasive tests with, with speedy test results, supporting our family members through their visits. It really has to be a rally here. And, uh, you know, our, our, our premiers and our prime ministers certainly uh, indicated that they were going to make long-term care a priority. Well, we need to make sure that they do, but we need to be there beside them. And I think, as, uh, as has mentioned, so often things happen to us, to our residents, to our to our the people who work in this system, it really has to be about how are we going to get there together, and and certainly that's my challenge to the system and to the general public and to all of you. Um, let let's do this together. It's not a an if, it 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 must be a how. Um, but you know when you when we've got these opportunities come together to share to uh, be friends in 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 our world we call it friend raising. And I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be able to, to count uh, among my friends and the friends of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association, the people on this panel today, among others. So thank you for your leadership, Ken Age and, and Laura. Uh, it's nice to see you not on a TV screen, but uh, this is a great initiative and thank you. Thanks very much, Donna. It has been a an interesting time where organizations have been pulling together in the most extraordinary way. So I'll invite you to mute your video and thank you so much. And we'll pull into our next guest. Amy Kapow is the CEO of the Ontario Caregiver Organization. Amy, you are supporting caregivers across the whole continuum of care. And boy, have we never needed that as much as we needed in the time of COVID-19. Yes, we're talking about, you know, caregivers in long-term care, but we're talking about caregivers at home with young children. We're talking about people in the middle years where they're trying to do both. We're talking about spouses who are also caregivers of their partners while at the same time trying to support grandchildren. You know, all the issues that are so easy to figure out. So we are so delighted to have you here today to share with us some of your insights into what you think we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive for caregivers. Well, thanks, Laura, and thanks to all of my colleagues. It is great to be a part of this discussion and for caregivers to be recognized as a part of this important dialogue about what it means to be age inclusive. And certainly for us at the Ontario Caregiver Organization, where we're supporting Ontario's estimated 3.3 million caregivers, uh, this group of caregivers is so important because we know that the experience of caregiving can change 
change over time. Uh, but there are some aspects of caregiving that don't change at all. Uh, so our commitment to caregiving, our desire as caregivers to be a part of the healthcare team and to be recognized and included as a part of the healthcare team, those kinds of things remain consistent. And I think that they are really important aspects of uh, inclusiveness uh, broadly. And so, you know, the themes that have come up uh, from my colleagues today and some of the other ones that are reflected in voices uh, would be things that, that I would echo. Uh, many, many caregivers we talk to uh, talk about the priority and the goal of aging in place, and we know that that is the desire of many, many caregivers and the people that they care for. And in the absence of that opportunity for any number of reasons, how can both the person that they care for and the caregiver be a part of decision making, transition planning, and the ongoing uh, best care for the individual that they care for? Uh, that's really, really important. And I think in terms of COVID-19, we've seen some successes and some challenges in that regard. So we have been working with long-term care, we have been working with hospitals, we have been working with other forms of congregate living to talk about how caregivers can be continue to be a part of really important dialogues, really important decisions, and also to the greatest extent possible, the active day-to-day -day care for the person that they care for in both a physical and mental health capacity. And so, you know, we've seen some real progress in that regard. Uh, it's been challenging for many caregivers but we're moving that dialogue forward and would like to see that continue to move forward. I think it's really important to echo what I've heard from many of my colleagues about the fact that both caregivers and the people that they care for are people with full, rich lives, personalities, and priorities, and they want to be able to bring their whole selves to the table, and they want to bring their knowledge and their expertise to those caregiving discussions and practices. And so, you know, what I've heard from many others already today uh, would, would be very much in alignment with uh, what we uh, expect to see in that age inclusive environment where caregivers can be seen as a critical source of information and decision making. Um, I think it would be helpful too to talk about um, what that looks like in this environment. Uh, we need to remember that caregivers are in a way a very, very heterogeneous group. They may be seniors themselves who are caring for a partner, they may be caring for another family member or neighbor, but they may also be parents who are caring for an adult child and they're looking at what are some of the transitions that they need to plan for uh, as their lives and circumstances evolve. And so when we look at caregivers, we can see some commonalities in terms of the commitments that they've made in their lives, but the particularities of people's lives and the ways that they can and want to provide care can be really, really varied. And so when we can see representation of caregivers within long-term care, within hospitals, at those decision-making tables um, where, where people are planning policy, where people are uh, looking at access and inclusion of caregivers at different uh, junctures, and also what caregiver education might look like uh, to ensure uh, that, that they can be safely involved in the day-to-day -day care. We'd like to see caregivers represented broadly at those tables. Additionally, though, caregivers tell us time and again that they really want those open lines of communication with the individuals who are involved in the care of, of the person that they are also caring for. So that's that healthcare team part. And they really want to be recognized through formal and informal mechanisms for the role that they play. And we hear from caregivers that there's often quite, quite a disparity uh, about how they are treated. Sometimes that's across different organizations. Sometimes that depends on the individual that they're talking with at any given time. So the better understanding that we have about caregivers as a partner in care, uh, then we really see an opportunity to facilitate better communication with caregivers on that one-to-one -one basis. So I want to thank the folks at CanAge who have shared some of the information that we have at the Ontario Caregiver Organization. 
Uh, you can check out our dedicated COVID-19 webpage as well as a number of resources for seniors. And I'm really looking forward to continuing this dialogue about how we recognize caregivers as an important part of that caregiving and healthcare team. Thanks so much, Amy. We really appreciate all your wonderful leadership. As I say, you know, it's always been important, but when you took the job, did you ever think that you would be navigating during the time of COVID-19? I don't think anyone did. So <laughs> I did not. <laughs> Thank you so much for the work. Again, great resources available. We'll let you uh, head back and we will invite now to the stage uh, Jennifer Wojciechowski. And Jennifer, we've been working together a little bit on some projects and proposals to make sure that the North, the more rural, remote, fly-in communities, communities really outside of even just major urban centers in Canada. It doesn't take too long to get rural and remote in Canada, but it's quite another thing again when you have, the, say, Indigenous elders in, uh, you know, in you know, Kugluktuk, for instance, who are having the conversation about access to services. You know, it's easy for us to complain in urban centers or suburban centers, but when you're asking people to to wrestle with these issues, you know, from a place with a very different experience, it's helpful, and as well, very different cultural norms and hopes and expectations. So, so grateful that you could join and, and bring some of those perspectives here today. So I'm throwing it open to you. What do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive from your point of view? Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, as she said, to bring this uh, lens of, um, some of the challenges uh, in terms of health services, quality and access that elders have in rural, remote and indigenous environments. And I, I always like to preface before I get started uh, speaking is that I have a First Nations last name. I'm married to an indigenous, to an Odawa man from Manitoulin Island from the Kong First Nation, um, but I myself am not indigenous. And so I don't like to appear to be bringing an indigenous uh, voice to the, to the discussion uh, or to try to represent Indigenous people in some way. Um, but so anyway, here we are discussing um, how to, what can we do in terms of trying to improve the access and equity to services in rural and remote environment? And I want to highlight today two main themes. One is making sure that whatever service model is being proposed is locally relevant. And all, the second aspect I'd like to discuss is workforce stability. And if I had to pick one of those two things uh, as the most important, I think I would say the greatest of these is local relevance. But before we get there, I want to highlight a remote jurisdiction that's close to my heart and uh, that can maybe be a bit of a real example of what rural and remote ju jurisdictions are like across the country. So um, Nunavut, I lived there for 10 years. I had my babies there. It was a wonderful experience and I continue to do consulting work there. Um, there are 25 communities you can only access by air, uh, and most of them have fewer than 1,000 residents, with the pop total population of the territory being just under 40,000 residents. Um, Inuit elders in Nunavut are often unilingual Inuktitut speakers, and this comes as a surprise uh, sometimes when I'm speaking with people who are not that familiar with Nunavut, but um, some, some elders were caught up in the 60s scoop and were sent away to schools, but for the most part, until the 70s, Inuit lived very traditionally on the land. I think somebody's maybe not on mute, um, so we're getting a little background noise. Um, so for the most part, Inuit elders lived very traditionally on the land until the 70s. My own mom, who is Irish and 80, if had she been um, Inuit in Nunavut, would have been born on the land, would not have attended school. My first language would have been Inuit. So this is a very, very recent transition to a more sort of Western, Southern way of thinking. Um, and I'm sure you can also imagine the fear of COVID-19 ever reaching Nunavut, uh, potentially decimating this entire generation of uh, Inuit elders and their very strong link to traditional language and culture. Um, also, Nunavut has the lowest life expectancy of any province or territory at about 73 versus 79.6 years um, in, in the rest of Canada. So each community has a community health center that's got at least two nurses at a nursing station providing 24 seven emergency cares, public health services, clinical, clinical walk-in clinic services. Um, and they basically, for, for services that they're not able to provide, uh, provide sort of a triage service to send people out of the community 
to uh, bigger centers where they can access other services that they need. Um, so again, very, very different from people who live in, in Toronto or Ottawa where I grew up. Um, there are two seniors residences that offer assisted living residential care. Each of them has eight living spaces, deploying one of the chat terms as opposed to beds, um, and three facilities that offer um, residential care for more complex care needs with a total of 28 beds. So I'm sure you can imagine if you require advanced level of care and you're lucky enough to be able to get access to one of those beds, that facility might not be in the town where your family is, even if you're lucky enough to be in Nunavut where there may be nurses who speak your language. Uh, you, you, have, you would hope that your family has the resources to fly to visit you once in a while. Um, and if you can't access one of the beds within the territory, you're faced with the decision to either leave the territory altogether to access life belonging health services or to not choose to uh, opt out of life prolonging services so you can be home with the people that you love. Um, so this is a very, very different sort of scale of, of choices that people have in Nunavut. And I just wanted to kind of make it a little bit real for you so that you can imagine, um, imagine what that is like. Uh, a little bit more to provide a little bit more detail about life in Nunavut. Um, uh, Help Age Canada worked on, um, worked with a lot of organizations within Nunavut to establish the Nunavut Seniors Society. Um, and they, they helped lead consultations in 11 of Nunavut's 25 communities in 2011-12. And uh, through a lot of discussion um, with elders, with care providers, they identified that there are very troubling levels of elder abuse considered to be common, including physical, financial, emotional, and neglect. Um, it's difficult for unilingual elders, unilingual Inupiat speaking elders to access government programs or to know what benefits uh, and services they're entitled to access. Um, they consider healthcare, respite care, access to mobility assistance, dental care, even hearing aids, unattainable. You sometimes wait for a very, very long time um, or die before getting some of these basic uh, things that you need. Um, of course, housing is insufficient for everyone in Nunavut. Uh, the elders are living in very crowded homes, often multi-generations, but there's lots of social challenges as well. So, um, so although the isolation doesn't appear to seem to be a factor because people live in such crowded homes, um, in fact, elders report being feeling very lonely and isolated, emotionally and physically isolated from each other and from the younger generation. Um, other challenges, of course, were systemic around lack of service delivery standards and integration between services. Um, at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, where we strive to train health professionals who are prepared to provide service to people who live in northern and remote areas, um, or when they're operating in a hospital in southern Canada to understand the realities of people that they see, um, our curriculum is full of population health data and uh, case studies that paint this kind of picture, not only of Nunavut, but also in Northern Ontario, rural and remote communities. And I think that um, across Canada, the situation that I just described exists uh, to a greater or lesser degree. So what about solutions then? How do we, if we wanna think about improving access and equity of services to elders in rural and remote environments, where do we begin? And I think the needs are just very different. I think I, I don't think um, any advocates for rural and northern health services are suggesting that every single community should have a long-term care hub. That just isn't realistic. But a good starting place is very simple. Um, investments in workforce stability. So whatever services are available in the community, if every time you access that service, it's a different human being, and you have to tell them your story over again, they may or may not understand your culture or language. Um, this has a very high impact on the quality of service that you're receiving. We know that there is higher incidence of medical error with every handover uh, uh, of a patient from one service provider to another. Um, and often with transient service providers, there's data that shows that they tend to be more likely to look for a shorter fix. Say, well, that looks bad. Let's, let's you know, provide this medication and continue to monitor. And so maybe somebody else will um, do the diagnostic tests that are needed. I, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's well-meaning, but when you're not seeing a patient over and over and observing the progression of disease yourself, 
um, people tend to not receive the follow-up they need or the referrals that they require that would that would identify disease earlier in their lives um, and especially imagine mental health and retelling your trauma to a different person every time through an interpreter who's somebody in your community even which may have perceived confidentiality challenges as well um, and then for those workers that do decide to move to and stay in communities in these rural and remote communities they tend to burn out because the the the, the the lack of resources and level of need is so high. So all of these factors affect the quality of service that anyone receives in Nunavut. And I think it's just an order of magnitude more sort of painful when it's for these elders um, who really are very vulnerable. Um, and with a stable workforce, you can offer training, maybe advanced services for, for elders, maybe advanced services on identifying and responding to um, elder abuse or uh, working with people with dementia, etc. But instead, when you're constantly managing this revolving door of basically trained people who come and go, um, you're really not th tackling that one thing would help make a big difference to the quality of life and services that uh, people in remote and rural communities receive. Now, I think I may have, I, I've been told that if I go a little bit over five minutes, it's okay, but I, I'm just about to wrap up. Um, so, Local relevance is the other piece that I wanted to talk about. So when I was the Canadian project lead on an international study related to workforce sustainability and stability, um, our partners included professionals, academics, administrators who worked in rural and northern areas of Scotland, Sweden, Iceland, Norway, Ireland, and Canada. And we basically all agreed that across all these boundaries and oceans and language and culture differentials, as rural and remote residents we had and providers, we had more in common with each other and a better understanding of each other's realities and challenges than we, than we have with people in urban centers in our own countries. There was basically a general consensus that um, although all the decisions that affect us and our funding and our service models and everything else tend to be made in Southern and urban centers, um, there was a general feeling that those people don't really understand what truly is needed and what would truly help. Um, and when this is coupled with cultural differences, such as um, making decisions about services and service delivery models in indigenous communities, the difference in perspective is even greater. So um, through that work, we created a framework for rural remote workforce stability that you can actually look at at www.rr, as in recruit and retain, rr, makingitwork.eu. It was a European Union funded initiative. Um, and there's all, there's all kinds of elements there about you know, promoting the training of rural and northern residents or providing training placements in rural and remote locations. Um, you, you're welcome to look at that. But I wanted to just finish by touching on two of what we call the um, uh, conditions for success of any of these types of initiatives to advance service delivery models, um, workforce stability in rural and remote environments. The first one is that for those of us who work as in, in, in government or in um, national organizations, we need to acknowledge that, you know, which typically are headquartered in Southern environments, we need to acknowledge that the issues and challenges are unique and that we don't really understand them in rural and remote communities. We sometimes say, if you've been to one remote community, you've been to one remote community. They're all very different and often the solutions that's needed in one community uh, that would have the highest impact is very different from what would have the greatest impact in a community just a couple hundred miles away. Um, so we need to understand that the, the issues are unique and that we probably can't make any assumptions about what they are. Um, and that's a really important sort of condition for success if, you, if you'd like to make a difference in rural and remote environments. It's one of the, the conclusions that our working group drew. And then the other one is, of course, the importance of engagement of the affected people. And I know that I'm singing to the choir here with all of our um, uh, other speakers who are advocates for the voices of care providers, of residents in long-term care homes, et cetera. Even the paper we're talking about is called Voices. Um, but when we're talking about rural and remote residents, please remember that not about us without us. Um, statement around um, making sure that we actually ask people and understand uh, to be involved in the design of the services that are going to impact them. 
And that is what I wanted to share. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your perspectives. I know you've been working on this area for a long time and your, your views about how service and care delivery need to be differentiated from those in the South and also to understand the cultural norms are hugely helpful. I'm going to, um, at this point, invite everybody to join again. So everyone can uh, join again. Excellent. Welcome back up to the stage. Thanks very much. So this is where we get to have a little bit of fun. And, you know, what a wonderful set of voices. What a wonderful panel to have you all here. Rachel has uh, popped off to question period because that is actually her job. And so she wanted to express her her greetings and her points of view and welcomes everyone to reach out to her and I have her contact information and she's invited folks participating to share that and get a hold of her as well. Okay, I know that we have Brett, one of our policy officers at the waiting as our host and Brett's been actively monitoring the, um, the chat, the questions and so on. So Brett, over to you, who is our first question? Thanks, Laura. Our first question comes from Sarah in Ontario, who wants to know, as seen during COVID, communication challenges between residents and their families, as well as long-term care staff and families have really been exposed. Um, how can transparency and more correspondence be uh, improved in long-term care? Yeah, Sarah, that's a really good question to ask. I'm laughing a little bit ruefully because as you can see the other participants, I think it's fair to say that communication, transparency, and again, D, coming back to your piece about resident voice, but also voices of caregivers, voices of systems, and, and long-term care homes who were saying, you know, we don't have any staff here. Like, how do we do it? So that I, I'm going to ask each one of you, it's such a good question. I'm going to ask each one of you in turn a little bit of that to build on it. But Dee, I'd want to give it to you first. You're the one who's, uh, you know, amplifying that particular voice. Communication, transparency, how do we do better? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for the question. Um, in, in the last few months, the predominant um, complaint coming in, whether it's through the Ombudsman or uh, Ministry of, of Long-Term Care Action Line, has been the lack of consistent and effective communication between uh, management of homes and residents and their, their families, their, their caregivers. Um, I have many, many, many residents who have contacted us at OARC saying that they found out about the status of COVID and what's going on in their home, either through social media or through their families, their sons, their daughters calling them. Um, it, it really is, is problematic. I think that the, the focus, not, 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 um, not that it was um, malicious by any intent, but I think the focus, the primary focus initially was in the physical prevention, uh, di disease prevention and, and, and infection control to the abandonment in many cases of the psychosocial and emotional well-being of residents. So residents, um, knowing that something's going on in their homes, unable to stick their head out of their door to have conversations with peers, with team members, with, with anyone to get a realistic look at what's going on. Um, residents have said to us that the ambiguity of not knowing is far worse than the truth and the transparency of what truly is happening. So um, from a resident standpoint, I believe that, and, and this comes directly from residents, any and all communication, uh, verbal, emails if appropriate, um, printed if appropriate, all of that is really vital to, to residents really having a sense of what's going on in their home. Thanks so much. And I, I know that a lot of us get together regularly and are trying to problem solve. And again, I mean, it's just, when we talk about communications, it's also in real time, isn't it? It's by the time that you get some kind of information you know, that information could be half a day old. It could be quite different. So there's a timeliness piece to it as well. Amy, I want to come from you. Caregivers were very um, 
focused on raising their concerns. Certainly we saw the rise of the whole movement of not just a visitor, making sure that you know folks are recognized as essential parts of the care team. We've got some of that in legislation as well. I wonder if I could ask you to kind of build off this idea of communication and transparency, but also share a little bit about the experiences of, of family caregivers, particularly perhaps in the long-term care sector over the time of the quarantine. Sure. Well, I would say communication is absolutely the number one common denominator in both situations where caregivers feel they have been well included and where they haven't. So, you know, where caregivers say things have actually gone as well as they could have under the circumstances, there has been high volumes of frequent communication. And where they feel challenged in any number of ways, communication is probably the first thing that they would raise uh, within, you know, the challenges that they faced. So uh, no one has ever told us that they were over communicated <laughs> with, you know, so everybody wants to have as much information and as many open lines of communication as possible. And I think that that does a couple of things. One is around trust. One of the big issues uh, that we hear about from caregivers is around the erosion of trust whether that's related to their particular caregiving responsibilities or whether it's around the broader engagement of caregivers in a variety of settings, whether that's healthcare, long-term care or otherwise. Um, but the other thing that we've seen as a common theme related to communication is the modalities of communication. We cannot use a one-size-fits-all model when it comes to being inclusive. We can't assume everybody is going to see it on video or watch your, your, your email or see something on social media. We need to be communicating over multiple channels. And for some people, that means posting a message in the window that people, even if they can't cross the threshold of a long-term care home or other uh, type of um, area where they may receive care, they need to be able to access that uh, information in high and low tech ways and in many different modes. I think that's one of the big lessons learned that we can all take away. Yeah, those exactly the diversity of is really important. You know, when people were coming to long term care homes across this country, you know, and they were staring at the doors and the doors were locked and they did not know, is it in this home? Can I come in? Are are there staff? Are are there ways that I can help? Many, many care providers who are more, you know, I would say unpaid caregivers. There's nothing informal about it, but perhaps unpaid caregivers, you know, wanted to know how they could assist. And so that, you know, having that even just up in the window, as well as being able to get it on Twitter is really, really important. So thanks. Donna, you've been at the center of communications, you know, 24 seven on behalf of not just, you know, one home, but on behalf of a large number of homes. And I know it's been kind of a nonstop communication strategy. You know, what were you hearing from your homes? I mean, they're the ones who are trying to keep people safe. They're the ones who are trying to provide care provision. And at the same time, we know how important it is. What were homes saying and, and what did your association learn about communication during this time? Well, to, to Amy's point, you can never communicate enough. You can never over communicate, you know, certainly, the challenge of, of the sector being outside of those other pieces of the healthcare system really uh, was a dis disadvantage to communication. Uh, when we started this, the focus really was on hospitals. Um, but I, you know, I would say we know more today than we certainly knew in February, March uh, about COVID-19 and the guidance changed continually. And often at uh, midnight on a, on a Saturday morning, effective immediately. So and there's lots of, been lots of interpretation and reinterpretation, uh, and uh, you know depending on where you live or where your the the home is situated, you can get different guidance from your local public health unit or your local hospital or your local uh, regional authority than you were getting from the chief me medical officer. So everyone had an opinion, uh, and unfortunately that meant that you know, the, the, well, the homes were, were getting a different direction as to what they needed to do, that, that really did disadvantage the communications with, with the residents and their families. And, and I do think that so much of what was going on too was happening in real time, and, and I'm not making excuses for people, but that fear, fear was uh, a, a real driver. And I think even as we're in our second wave in Ontario now, fear continues to be an issue. And 
we do have an opportunity to learn from those lessons learned. Uh, and certainly there are new, new approaches to communicating with our residents and our families with webinars and Zoom and social media. And um, you know, we've got to find a way, again, to my earlier rally cry, to rally around. And the more people we have working in our homes, the more we can support our family caregivers from any essential caregivers coming in, the more we can support that communication function. Uh, we know that when COVID gets into a home, uh, many cases staff uh, end up going off with their own positive test results uh, that the staff complement can, can just implode. And I would say this time, uh, our staff, like our residents, are far frailer. So uh, the mental health and well-being and I think uh, Jennifer, you touched on this, the mental health and well-being and the resilience of our uh, residents, our families and our staff is so diminished as we go forward. This really has to be about how do we support each other through this? How do we make sure we're building out those lines of trust uh, and asking each other, how, how are we doing? Uh, and sharing whether or not we're, we're doing well. And uh, I think that communication is gonna be profound just in terms of those core supports and making sure that people are not isolated. Thanks so much. Yeah, what I mean, what a communications challenge has been and in a time where people are scared, right? It's not just it's not just about the communication, but it's also to address their emotional and social needs because if you're so blocked with fear, you can't actually necessarily you know, take in the information and, and how do you share that information on a bilateral or multilateral way. Jennifer, I know there are so many challenges associated to communication in Northern and, and Indigenous communities, particularly like fly-in communities and so on. Um, I wanted to ask you to kind of give us a, a bit more of a lift. Have you seen where communication goes well? And in particular, you know, we've got you know, concerns certainly in some communities about COVID-19, we don't only have to talk about COVID, but about care and care relationships, long-term care. Where have you seen communication go well? I mean, you might need to unmute, there you go. Thank you, that's a really good question and I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential in the small rural and remote communities to do strong communication in ways that will actually reach people um, through community radio and community TV. So I'd like to tell you, this is, this is true as true in Northern Ontario, uh, other Northern and Indigenous communities as it is in Nunavut where um, like the CBC radio, there's, a, there's some law where every day, there's one radio station in town and every day at certain time points, you must play CBC so people can either hear the weather or certain things. And otherwise, for the rest of the day, it's just kind of live feed for whoever's down at the, you, you might be sitting in the community and the radio's on and you hear somebody, the music stops in the middle of the song and it'll be like, if anybody sees Moses, tell him I want my saw back. And then the song plays again. Like it's a very organic, real way that people communicate with each other. And in fact, for this COVID proposal that we've, that we've been discussing together um, for COVID support in Nunavut, one of the plans was that we will be, um, which we're still waiting to hear about, but that's another story, is that we would like our community intermediaries who are going to be sort of uh, speaking with elders to find out what their concerns actually are. Like across language barriers and everything else, there may be urban legends flying around like crazy that you can, you know, get pregnant by shaking hands, you know, you can get COVID by, you know, I don't know, whatever. And, and we don't know what is debilitatingly stressful for people in this time where people are very, very concerned. So when we find out what that is, we'll have our community intermediaries connect all across the territory once every couple of weeks and talk about what are the big issues that people are worried about. Let's design a PSA and go back and deliver it in your community over the radio in your own language a few times this week. And that's where I think there's a lot of potential and pretty quick, like that's where the small and rural places, you can actually act pretty fast and, um, and help people with communication. So yeah, nimble and organic is kind of what I'm going to be taking away from that nimble and organic. And I love that. Who's got my saw? I mean, it's so totally fun. exactly what happens. It's hilarious. I'm calling you from a community of uh, 67 long residents who are here year round. I think we've swelled to about, you know, 
70 right now. And I could literally go outside my door and ask anyone. And I promise you within five minutes, everyone in the community will know A, that I asked, what that I need, and the three people have brought me their version of it. So I don't be out of case. So community is really important. Thank you so much for sharing that to me. But I know we have a lot of questions and I, I want to get to them. So what's our next question, Brett? Well, Laura, our next question comes from Moira Welsh, who wants to know, while the inclusion of essential family caregivers is important, what else can be done to help all people in long-term care avoid a repeat of the isolation experience that we saw in the first wave? Okay, that's an anyone question. Who wants to jump in? Donna, maybe over to you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is, uh, you, you know, we know what worked in wave one. <laughs> We know when, when we finally turned around and got stabilized, we know is, is we were made a priority. Long-term care was made a priority by the, by the government. So we were prioritized for personal protective equipment. We were prioritized for testing and quick turnaround of test results. Uh, we were uh, prioritized for staff help, getting bodies in the homes. Uh, we, we had help from all over the healthcare system is, and even the school boards came in to help. We know that we need people, we need staff. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be more challenging this time around, but you know, the government certainly has uh, demonstrated its ability to pivot really quickly. And I do believe that if we work together, we can mobilize an army of uh, staff supports, especially in those hot zones where we know uh, that, that staff may well be infected and then can't come into work. So we need to make sure that we've got, uh, you know, the ability to move people around very, very quickly into our homes as, as, as fast as possible. And we know that we need to have medical support in the homes. Uh, that's, that's very, very important for our residents, for, for, our, for our family members and for our staff that, that gives us a lot of comfort. Uh, those, are, those are really key pieces for us. Uh, and certainly we know that um, we, we need to continue to work in partnership with our hospital partners, our, our emergency service partners uh, and others. It, uh, but it, we have to move quickly. It's time to mobilize. We've got to move forward and uh, we can do this if we work together. Amazing, Amy, over to you. Thank you so much, Donna. Yeah, I really appreciate this question because it's been one of the things that we did talk about in terms of caregivers, but Moira makes a really good point that this is a broader question that actually comes back to inclusivity. One of the things that really gave me a lot of understanding about how Canadians can step up in the first wave was the efforts that were made by organizations as well as self-organized groups to support people who might have chosen to isolate or been in isolated circumstances related to COVID-19. Through our Caregiving Communities Initiative, we saw over 250 organizations step up to provide grocery shopping, friendly phone calls, check in for people who were living in isolated circumstances. So this does go well beyond long term care. I, I think the two key themes that were um, highlighted through that were around collaboration and connection. We have seen this as well through organizations working with seniors broadly and certainly within long term care as well that ongoing dialogue, those active collaborations. What can we actually do to roll up our sleeves to do this together? And how can we make something that's greater than the sum of its parts in collaboration than if we all go to our own corner to do it separately? So I think that if we prioritize mental health, which has come up as a key theme in the discussion today, and we recognize that that affects not only residents in long-term care, not only caregivers, but broadly people living in the community and certainly all of our seniors, if we say, let's work together and let's keep those lines of communication and connections open, then we can really help to reduce the isolation more broadly through these innovative and responsive solutions. Dee, I know that you've probably got something to add on to that. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Laura. Um, so the negative effects of isolation, uh, to avoid that, we need people. And I'm just gonna echo what Donna has said. We need people to be brought into the long-term care homes that are, uh, in, in essence, uh, residents experience aides, resident experience ambassadors, whose sole responsibility will be to uh, facilitate the visiting programs for the homes. We have surveyed a number of homes. There has been no home in my experience in the last 
four months that has been able to provide a robust visiting program um, because it, it, it pulls 10, 12, 15, 18 of their team members every single day to provide that. So there needs to be teams of people the, with increased foot traffic in the homes, that increases the risk of, of COVID coming in. So we need to be able to have more people in the home that are hired by the home, accountable to the home with PPE training and supervision to provide visiting program, robust visiting programs and, and facilitate all that is involved with that to, to um, alleviate that sense of alienation and loneliness that residents and, uh, and their loved ones are experiencing. Perfect. Jennifer, do you want to just jump in here and uh, talk a little bit about isolation? Isolation can mean a lot of different things uh, in the context that you're bringing forward. Well, yes. Well, and what I'll say is um, First Nations in Ontario, uh, they just shut their borders. You weren't allowed to leave the reserve to go shopping even. You had to buy all your groceries in the little store in your own community. You, you, could, you had to ask permission from the band office if you had a medical appointment to go somewhere and then you weren't, weren't supposed to shop or anything else while you while you were out of the community. So people really felt trapped in their communities, including like my mother-in-law and my, you know, older people felt particularly trapped just conceptually that they couldn't even leave their little their little reserve. And then um, in um, in Nunavut, uh, while there were no cases, the borders were shut down, there was no travel, and people were told to stay home. And a lot of elderly people would, of course, not even the church wasn't running. Sometimes that's the only time anybody would see them out of their house is every Sunday at church to know if they're okay or not. Um, and so I have to say, I think that what, what I would suggest is something very similar to what Dee is suggesting, is that um, some kind of visitation, visiting program where I think all of the local kind of community well, wellness type staff who are non-professional, um, like not health professionals, but you know, are kind of outreach workers in the communities. I think the first time around we're kind of scared and didn't have a mandate and wasn't, you know, nobody really knew quite what to do. But I think if a second wave comes to First Nations in, in Ontario and similarly, if the virus uh, arrives in Nunavut or, or even isolation measures remain, um, some kind of program to just have regular contact with the elders is really, 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 really needed, particularly when we're concerned that rates of um, abuse may be going up unnoticed, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think I would just echo really what Dee was saying. People need contact. What a fabulous discussion. It's time to hear a little bit from you. So we've got a poll and we're for our folks who are participating online. Let's bring forward our poll. So some of our team members will post a poll up and here they are. I'll read them out to you. We can answer anytime. The first question is, what percentage of seniors live at home and will never go into long-term care? You've got three choices, 63%, 75%, or 93%. So what percentage do people think will live at home and never go into long-term care? The second is, do you think the government should invest in more adult day and respite programs? Yes or no? And the third is, do you think long-term care homes need more staff? So three questions there. The first is, what percentage of seniors live at home and will never go into long-term care? 63, 75, or 93 are your choices. And what do you, th do you think the government should invest in more adult day respite programs? The last is, do you think that long-term care homes need more staff? So let's see, we'll let the poll sit open for another second or two. All right, we're gonna end the poll and I'll just share these results with you. Here's what we saw. So the uh, the answer was 93%. And uh, it's a little bit different depending on which jurisdiction you are. It's a little bit different where you are, but broadly the statistics are about 93% of all older people will live at home. They may need some supports, but, uh, but they're not gonna go into long-term care. It's important to remember when we're talking about the health and housing continuum to have that continuum of care model, because if you're just looking only at a narrow piece, you're not capturing the broad uh, perspective. Well, we have a lot of agreement on the next two, 100% on adult day and respite programs, 100% on needing more staff. So that um, that's a very interesting piece. Brett, I'm going to squeeze one more quick question and I'm going to ask you all to be a little bit shorter in your answer because I wanted to get another one in. Brett, what question do we have that we can knock out before we have to wrap today? Laura, I've got a question from Kathleen who asks, in the U.S., the greenhouse model for care speaks to empowering the frontline staff. How can we adapt the Canadian models in long-term care to empower the staff? 
Yeah, and in our voices uh, roadmap, we talk about under the sea, emotion focus or transformative models of care. Greenhouse is one of those many types of care models. You know, John, I'm going to give this one to you first. You know, we're talking about, you know, not the medical model, not an institutional model. So how do we as a system, how do we as a system move to more emotion focus or transformative models of care? D, I'm going to come to you right after that. Yeah, it, it's a great question and a great comment. This is the moment where we can actually innovate. And certainly we've seen the greenhouse model. We've got um, the butterfly model uh, that, in, you know, it's, it's actually not supposed, not actually actively supported by our legislation. So, you know, I think we need to um, step back, think of who the people are who are caring and actually start to build out a continuum of care and have, a, have that bigger discussion about what is long-term care? What does it look like? Uh, it, it's not a cookie cutter. Let's let's look at what we need in local communities. Uh, in, certainly in Ontario, we are looking at uh, building a, and rebuilding our homes. Uh, the, we have far too many long-term care homes who were built to 1970 standards. Um, but let's let's see where the innovation is. I would argue that no one's got it perfect yet anywhere in the world. Uh, so Ontario, Canada, we have an opportunity to lead, to take some of those other models uh, and build on them and make them better. And I think working together and having these discussions, we will get there. The, the, the last voice will be the voice of the residents. So before we wrap up, we're talking about transformative models of care. You know, what are your thoughts on that from your perspective? Transformation is, uh, is analogous to culture change and culture change is social change and it takes time, but we are right in the fire right now. We are right in the thick of it. And I think to always look back, to always refer back to the resident, what do residents want? What do they say they need? Who do they say they need it from? And develop a system that supports the resident's need, not to make assumptions that we as care providers know best, but to look at, at our own humanity in all of this. Yeah, and just echoing again, Jennifer, your, your thoughts again, not, don't assume, don't assume that people actually, you know, have this concern. You may think that they do, but that's not their concern at all. Making sure that older people are integral parts of those solutions that we value and understand the, the notion of culture and norms. I know there's a question as well about nutrition in there, which is always a question about cultural appropriateness. And Amy, I know that you're also at the forefront of, of integrating that care perspective in our health and housing continuum. I could keep talking to you guys all day. I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic, but I'm gonna to need to wrap up. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna share and I invite you to keep yourself on the screen. Don't, don't feel like you have to go anywhere, but I'm just gonna share a few extra resources for people. Um, I know also that there's always a, uh, a hope that we'll cover more. There's always a desire to cover more. We are covering more. And so some of these same issues, particularly around ideas of home care and community support and community care. We're going to pick those up again tomorrow afternoon. So this isn't the last time. I also want to share with you that we're continuing what we call can age conversations. And I've got my eye on each and every one of you where we're going to do deep dive one on one or two on one conversations about these issues. So you can help uh, by volunteering if you're interested in being part of that. We really want to be able to get the voices of people and, and hear more about what their issues are. We've uh, shared a bunch of different links. You've got lots of links in the slide and all of this information will be shared and posted. Really, we put in some of your resources there. So they're active links that you can have and we'll make sure that that information is so critical about that Through Our Eyes program, really helpful and important. We have all of these resources available on our webinars and our YouTube site. Again, we've been live streaming from Facebook and uh, that's exciting for us to be doing. Please take action. One of the things you can do is download a copy of your uh, Voices document, The Voices of Canada Seniors, a Roadmap to an Age Inclusive Canada. Or just go online. You can see it very dynamically. Just click on one of the letters, you'll get the issues. You click on the issues, you'll get the recommendations. There's things that we can all do. It's not just about government, it's not just about other people. There's things that we as individuals can do, things we can change ourselves, things our communities and our organizations can be actively involved in. So it's not about someone else. Just 
just picking up on Dee's point. It's about culture change, and it's about making sure that we're part of that culture change. Uh, our friends at Help Age Canada, very dear friends, are, are raising money constantly to provide expert support, help, and assistance, as well as emergency responses and relief where it needs. And they're focused as well on helping to provide donations and philanthropy in these particular areas. So if you get moved to do so, feel free to donate to our friends at Help Age Canada. They've got a big button on it. You can find it also on our screen, and it goes to them. They're doing just extraordinary work. Join. Join CanAge, count. One of the things you can do, just click canage.ca.join. It's free. We would like to add your voice to the voices of Canada's seniors as we raise up for positive change and transformation. So please do feel free. You'll get our newsletters. You'll get our active engagement. You'll connect to all kinds of great materials. But most of all, when I go to government, when we go as a team, I can say, you know, we represent you and you know that you are part of that positive change. We've been hosting a free online conference for four days now. And one more day is our fourth day, and that's tomorrow. It's been so helpful. Thank you again to our sponsors and our co-hosts and our supporters to make it free for everybody to participate. It's critically important that we do that. And we are jumping off into some of these issues. And I know that they all intersect with each other because poverty is an ongoing issue. It intersects care, it intersects workforce, it intersects the ability to uh, participate and engage. So we're gonna look at a wide number of issues on economic security with these amazing keynote speakers. We've got Mike Powell talking from the Canadian Federation of Pensioners about how to avoid another Sears type of situation people have been putting into their retirement and how do we make sure that those retirement wages for pensions stay safe. Lori Campbell is a fabulous expert in the area of consumer issues and she's going to help us navigate some of those issues without patting us on the head and saying don't buy coffee. She's going to actually help to share strategies and information about navigating these issues in uncertain times. Lucy Becker is at IROC and the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada has been putting out issues on seniors and vulnerable investors and what we need to know about that. Deborah Gillers is from New Brunswick and she is bringing the Financial and Consumer Services Commission perspective. She's been actively engaged in financial elder abuse response and prevention in addition to other types of regulation. And I know that she's got lots to share. New Brunswick has been at the cutting edge of some of these issues. So we're excited that she's going to join us. The last day picks up on some of the issues that we talked to today. So again, you want to talk more about home care, more about housing, innovations to help age in place, check out our session on social inclusion. Eastern time, it's 1 to 2.30. And, uh, and we'll be talking about a wide variety of issues. We have a lot of our great friends talking from coast to coast to coast about some of the innovations they're engaged in. From Alex Carruthers at the Toronto Public Library talking about you know, libraries and community spaces and the role that those things play to Emily jones Janas, looking at, from a Connected Canadian's point of view, a program that helps to promote digital literacy to older people across Canada. Dr. Raza Mirza is going to be talking about co-housing, housing strategies, housing affordability, innovation, and, uh, and also some of the support systems that they put in place during COVID-19 to help age inclusion and, and where intergenerational programs have really thrived. Al uh, Kahir Laji has really been at the heart and center of United Way response, and he's going to be talking from the, the community-based, what have we done on men's loneliness and men's sheds? How have we had food that shows up to people? One of the questions that we had was about, is there an app that will help us get you know, resources? The answer, yes, yes, uh, United Way did do that work, and we'll explore more about what we learned during that process. And my dear friend Gregor Snedden at Help Age Canada is going to talk about, you know, responding to the urgent needs of communities in real time and what they learned and how they're forward planning to make sure that social inclusion is at the heart and minds of philanthropy, of communities, organizations, and governments. And so that's going to be a wonderful issue. We know that we haven't got to every question, but we are tracking all of the questions that have come in. And we are going to be sharing information about those answers on Twitter, social media, and so on. And remember, you're going to get a little bit of an email from us with just the fastest questionnaire. I mean, it's seconds out of your day, but it makes a big difference to us. We really want to make sure that we're continuously improving. We really appreciate your feedback. You can get a whole to me at laura at canage.ca or contact us at info at canage.ca. The whole team will do that. We answer everybody that writes to us. 
we have a wide variety of ways to share the information. And also we know that it is incredibly important that we amplify the voices of our panelists today, their organizations and of older people. So here's a, a wide variety of ways to get a hold of us. Again, please join. We would love to have your voice. We can't write to you unless you join and then we're allowed to. So that's a really important piece. Please canh.ca slash join a free membership. It's been an incredible, incredible conversation with you. It's been an incredible conversation, um, dynamic, informed, expert, and hopeful. One of the things that I took out of today is the importance that, you know, it says we work together and we collaborate is a thing that we're always talking about, but this has been an actual behind the scenes collaboration to respond. And we have people who've been working tirelessly from our policymakers uh, to the people on the ground providing on the ground care. Thank you all. I'm going to invite everybody to unmute themselves who is a panelist and just kind of say a quick goodbye to everybody before we leave. Bye now. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Be well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining, everyone. Have a terrific afternoon.